Hello and welcome to another next part of my strong women along the coast. And this lady that I have got my guest today, you possibly don't know her name, but you most certainly know the company that she is general manager and actually owner of. And that is Specsavers in Marbella. And her name is Nerea Galdot Little. And I, I pulled it out because I want you to know her name, because we all know Specsavers, but we don't know her name. So hello and welcome. Welcome to Strong Women Along the Coast. How are you? Good morning, Sandy. I'm very well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. I mean, to find another strong woman along the coast is for me such a joy. Now, let, let's start at the beginning with you, pretty lady. Um, you were born, well, you came from San Sebastian, right? Correct, yes. yes. And then you didn't come straight to Marbella because you had a life before optics. You actually went to Sussex University. And what did yes. you do there? Politics? Politics and law, yes, and I graduated. And, and how come? What made you well, make that decision? It was my passion since I was very little. And um, Sussex University actually was the best one in Europe uh, for such a degree and, and master's degree. So okay. that's how I ended up doing it. Yes, uh, later on in life, I learned that um, law is very interesting, but politics is a different matter. Absolutely. But then did you uh, go into law and politics? Because I, I know that you've got another, um, uh, what can I call it, another passion that you went into for a long yes. time. Yes, yes. I did go into politics. I worked in uh, Brussels for a year. Oh. And uh, yeah, yeah, actually for the British government. And then uh, I came back uh, to the UK, I never left the UK. I used to commute uh, London, Brussels on a weekly basis. Uh, but then I came back to work to the UK and um, I got uh, settled in, uh, in the city, in London, doing uh, law for a, for a big uh, banking firm in the city. My goodness, so you were legal banking and that was for about 10 years? It was indeed, yes, yes. And that was enough that was to, to taste the experience. Yeah. Yes. And uh, then I decided to, to give up the city. Yeah. And uh, because of obviously the secrecy of my contract, I needed uh, to have a year off um, the industry. And then um, I returned to the, the you know, working environment uh, with a position in uh, Specsavers. But why, why did you decide to go into optics after such a very high, high, high uh, position? I don't say that you didn't start high in uh, optics, but you really had a very strong uh, international background. Well, you know, um, I found out uh, that uh, Specsavers wanted to uh, open barriers within uh, the European market. And that obviously had been a strong build of mine. Uh, so I only needed to get some knowledge in optics. And uh, I you know, really wanted to, to see what um, be a director for such a, a group uh, was like. And uh, that was it really. I um, focused on it and I got it. It's amazing. Let's just go back a little bit. Was it difficult in any of the other jobs that you had, positions that you had uh, in those days? Because I think that was 1996, around about then, that you actually started your main career at that time. For a female to get into those positions? It was difficult. And... Um... Unfortunately, it is still very difficult for women, as you probably know, to, to get such uh, positions. But uh, it doesn't mean that it's impossible. Yeah, everything is possible if you really want it. There, there's no Total. problem. But mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it wasn't easy. And did you have the same privileges that the men had? 
say in politics in in banking and in europe you never do you never do but that is um i suppose where we need to to show how strong we can be and how equal oh that ma- that makes my heart jump for joy because i know that i've been in a man's world all my life uh what yeah. with my scotland yard background and really i was the only female at that time in that uh, area so mm-hmm. i had the same sort of uh not problems but you really had to fight for whatever you wanted yes and let's it, call it a challenge <laughs> it was a challenge but for you you had such amazing steps so when you then decided that uh, spec savers was something that you would like to go into the optics uh business uh how did you start what does a woman have to do or where do what do people have to do to become optically um uh what's the word i'm looking for uh well to go into optics yeah to train yeah. correct yeah not to be in an optician myself uh obviously i had to get some uh, optical uh, preparation and uh, for the whole year i went into um let's say very compressed course of optics um learned everything about uh, about let's say the level of optics i needed um bearing in mind that uh, it was always in um, in my plan to to be surrounded by a good team of uh, optometrists uh and basically i started from the very bottom you know i um uh obviously after getting all the preparation that spexy was um, very kindly gave me uh i started from a reception uh for a few weeks then i tested the shop floor um you know the the retail industry if you want to call it that way uh, i experienced all the customer service and all the dealing with the public and then uh, obviously went into contracts department a uh, care care um then uh, i filled the position as a supervisor as a manager and then uh, i used to do a little bit um, office work as well to um with my director then to to take um, to get a taste of what um, you know a director has to do uh, behind the scene in your office from a financial and um, you know business point of view yeah. so i covered it all really and then uh, i uh, had to apply to become a director for the group and um there was a very intense preparation at the same time i remember i had a, something like a 6 hour interview in those days <laughs> and um and you know as i said earlier i got it and then um i did have all this experience in the uk i have to say and then i decided to uh, become a partner with the group in spain and marbella was chosen as uh, our destination was that your choice or was it spec savers choice in those days it was a spec savers obviously i agreed uh, to it uh, together with my husband uh, because obviously it was a big move after all those many years living in the uk uh, we we had to move home really yeah. so um So yeah that's how we we arrived to Marbella. Your life with the change. I heard you say something about that you had to do ear um training as well. I don't know about that side. Can you explain that to me please? I did to uh, a little bit uh, more in the let's say retail area because obviously there was an audiologist in the department who ran the department. I was more in charge of the uh, retail and uh, sales part of it. Uh but yeah I had to to do some training about all the little uh, you know um hearing aids and little bits and bobs but I have to say you know Spectivus is a, such a great company when it comes down to training uh they really help whoever wants to to learn and uh, you know whoever wants to promote themselves within the company so it was it was very easy hard work but very easy very it was a pleasure hard work is always a pleasure when you are successful and you have been Excellent. extremely successful tell me how did you choose your team when you decided okay you were coming down here 
Uh, you were going to be opening up in Marbella because this was what was offered to you and I'm sure it was a joy and a pleasure to be by the sea and, and still have a wonderful business with an incredible name behind you. And now you are the owner of Specsavers as well, which is a big joy. But now tell me how you choose your team because I know part of your team and they are so professional. Thank you. It was um, very hard work because obviously I was um, then in the UK and uh, I had to do a lot of research. Obviously, we advertised uh, the positions and you will never imagine the amount of CVs um, we received. It was incredible. So uh, everything started with um, telephone interviews. And then I did a few trips down to the south of Spain to hold the interviews in a, in a hotel that obviously we, we used to uh, do our meetings at. And um, I think it took a good, good four months process of uh, elimination. And, uh, and that's how we got um, the team we have nowadays. We obviously have new additions because with time we've, uh, we're bigger, we've grown, uh, but um, the originals are still here with, with us. Uh, well, it it's, you know, if, if everybody is happy, they stay. And when you walk through the doors, back say, there's, there's always a big smile and can I help you? And language isn't a problem because they speak all the languages. Is that correct? And they That's always, very cool. They always yes. speak to me in English because they, although I walk in and I say, hola, buenos dias, or whatever it is, they know that I am English. So their English is perfect. And... Uh, what other languages do we have? speak? Uh, obviously, uh, English, Spanish. Uh, we speak Arab, Arab, Arabic. Really? Mm -hmm. I say Arabic and Arab because there are actually two different uh, dialects uh, on in my team um, of these uh, languages. Uh, we speak a little bit of French and German. Okay. Now let, let's go back to your optical team. When they do their um, examinations, what are they looking for? Besides, well, yeah. can you see, can't you see what glasses you need? Yeah, um, that actually could be the main difference uh, between us and the rest of the optical industry in Spain at the moment. Uh, we are focused on um, visual health, the health of your eye not only the prescription that you may or not may need, but also um, the health of the back of your eye. For that, obviously, we do have um, very um, you know, high-end technology. Uh, everything is digital. And as you have experienced with us as well, uh, we, um, our main tool is a photography of the back of your eye, uh, which, in which we can identify uh, different pathologies and then we can, um, you know, explain everything to the customer, to the patient. If needed be, we can refer them to an ophthalmologist. Or if everything is good, then fantastic. We then uh, go into the shop floor to give them advice with whatever product they may need. I know that when I've had my eyes tested, and wonderful Carlos, who I love and adore and is so sweet to me, always says to me, now don't worry, it's not going to hurt, but I just want to look at the back of your eye just to make sure that everything is okay for you. So every time that I've come, which is usually once a year, and this has been now for six years that I've been coming to, to Specsavers to be checked, and uh, I have that uh, coming through as, okay, I'm clear, there's nothing I need to worry about. I don't need to go and see anybody further because I have been checked. And uh, I'm very happy to hear that that is one of the uh, situations that you give to everybody. It's not just... Everybody. Me. Everybody gets, uh, you know, gets uh, tested for uh, glaucoma. Uh, as I said, um, cataracts, different pathologies that we can identify uh, through this uh, photograph of the back of the eye. Yeah. Absolutely everything. Um, in fact, then later on in the testing room, 
our optometrists show our customers their their eye, their own eye on our iPads. Yes. So yes. it's really interesting at the same time. Yeah. Very interesting to see because otherwise we don't know what what's behind. Nothing. What's behind? How <laughs> many people do you now employ? But I mean, how many people do you now have working with you? We are a team of ten people. And when you started, how many? We started with four. Okay, so you've mm -hmm. really grown. Yeah. Uh, how yes. long have you been uh, in Marbella as Specsavers? This um, year, uh, we arrived in September 2012, so it'll be nine years for us in Marbella. Uh, although we didn't open till November, November the 5th. Okay. Remember, remember. <laughs> remember, remember the 5th of November. Guy Fox Day. <laughs> Yes. Uh, do yes, you sir. have any uh, ladies who are doing the same work that Carlos does? And I, I keep mentioning him because he's the only one that I've ever seen and actually ask for him. Mm -hmm, correct. Because you ask for him, obviously, he's the one that looks after you. But yeah, I've got uh, two ladies, actually, uh, optometrists. And um, it's a whole team of four optometrists. Uh, here, obviously, uh, we've got two testing rooms um, uh, on, on our premises, so uh, you will have here the help of two optometrists each day because obviously there is a rota, but uh, yeah, there are two ladies more. And uh, your spec savers is identical to the spec savers in the UK? It is actually a replica, uh, obviously, as being a, a young the store because obviously in the UK we've been going on for many years more um, you know the furniture is obviously the latest furniture technology um, and our um, frame collection is a little different there is a small uh, difference uh, with uh, the spec savers within the continent within Europe because we do have access to perhaps a few more models a few frames that uh, the UK has got access um, to, or vice versa, but it's pretty much exactly the same. And now I'm getting to the, the, the section which uh, it's a great pity that we've got to talk about, and that is COVID, COVID-19. Mm. How are you uh, working within the new situation of COVID and the safety regulations? We're working very hard, I have to say. It hasn't been easy uh, for anybody, of course, uh, but we're making a big effort to uh, try to guarantee a COVID-free environment for our team and our customers. Uh, we're working uh, with the door closed by appointment only, which doesn't mean that we don't um, try to see and help uh, whoever comes to the door without an appointment. We always try to accommodate and actually 99% of the, of the cases, we, we do see them on the, on the spot. Um, but by having the door closed, uh, we are guaranteeing that everything here is sterilized. So when uh, the customer, uh, obviously the clinical area is very important because at the end of the day, it was this clinical, uh, the distance is very, uh, short with the professionals, but um, we have obviously set up, uh, you know, a new system uh, to protect the professionals and the customers. And then when walking into the shop floor, as I said, every single product, every single frame gets sterilized all the time. So if let's say a customer tries 20 frames, the 20 frames will go into sterilizer later on and be put back on the shop floor, totally sterilized for the next customer. Um, we've got obviously a limitation of people who can be in the premises at the time. And we've been working like this for, for the last year already. Uh, so now we got used to it. Um, the worst uh, thing uh, is obviously the mask that we have to wear to protect ourselves because it is a must to, to wear an FP2. Uh, mask and it's you know it's, it's um, a lot of hours and wearing it is very uncomfortable but we have to do it it's the only way to get through this and also 
because I think our signature has always been our smile. Um, you kind of lose the expression of your, or your face with the mask, everything becomes more impersonal, a bit more clinical, but it is the situation we have to live at the moment and um, it's the only way through. The eyes still smile. You can still see the eyes smiling and, and, and that shows that. Uh, okay, so somebody has come in, we've had our eyes tested, everything is fine, and now we need a new prescription. Where does that get made? Everything gets made, uh, let's say, uh, our products come all from the UK. Okay. Uh, so therefore we get our lenses totally separated from our frames from the UK and everything then gets put together, uh, glazed, as we say in the industry uh, here. We do have a, a lab uh, on, the, on the top floor and um, that guarantees I have just lost you. Um, um, a oh, possibility okay. of uh, an aftercare of that place because we could have to change something or adjust something that you know the product doesn't have to go away for weeks. We can do everything on the spot. So yes, we do have a lab here with um, um, a technician and a lab manager. Okay, I'm just going to tell my viewers that we did lose, we heard your voice, but you did freeze a little bit, but not to worry because we carried on but I always like to say with Zoom, you never know when uh, there is going to be a glitch and we did have a glitch, but not a problem. Uh, tell me something else. Uh, when people have changed their uh, frames, what do you, and they don't want them anymore, what do you do with them? Can we bring them back to you? Can you use them again? Yes. Can you help yes. them? Can you help the community? Yes, as I said, um, we used to collect all the unwanted uh, frames, glasses in general, and then donate them to Lions International. We work very closely with them uh, here in Marbella and uh, in Costa del Sol in general. Uh, although at the moment um, we are a little bit on hold because of the situation, because we're not uh, wanting to obviously get anything from the exterior world, let's say, that could, you know, carry the virus or whatever it is. So at the moment, we're not collecting anything just to be cautious about it. But yeah, we've always done it, always done it. Yeah. Hundreds and hundreds of, uh, of unused glasses. So uh, for people that are watching, you've got unused glasses or glasses that they've got in their drawers, keep them until this situation is over and then bring them into the store because you can use them. Uh, you will obviously cleanse them as you have normally been doing. And then at least Lions International along the coast can get help. And what about for children? Uh, have you got a special way of treating children when they come in? Because you know those, those big heavy machines that you put by your eyes, it may just make kids feel, oh, I don't really want to go there. How do you deal with children? <laughs> you're right, you're right. Well, our, um, our um, eye test, our examin visual examination is a very different experience for children. Uh, the machines are still there. And this is when our uh, fantastic optometrist uh, skills come into place because they are the ones that um, deal with the children in such a lovely way uh, and their parents obviously because the minors have to be accompanied together with uh, an adult um, and then the whole site is different uh, you know there are no uh, all these letters that us adults have to read and so on but lots of colors and pictures and uh, it's a totally different experience. I've always <laughs> wondered that because I, I've only known ever uh, letters, but I didn't know what you did for children. So that's interesting, the, the different colors and of course with pictures of animals that they would know. What ages do you start uh, testing children? Uh, we start uh, from the age of three. Um, and then, you know, we see them on a yearly basis up to the age of 16, 18. 
and then uh, every two years. It depends on the case, really, because obviously some children need to be monitored more often. Um, and we have had a um, few babies as well, actually, that were born with a pathology that they needed glasses immediately. So, but that obviously comes from the ophthalmologist and the three, it has to come from, from a doctor. Right, right. That, that's, that's fascinating because this is, this is an area that I really, the optical side, I really know nothing about except I walk in to your store in Marbella and it's on uh, the main road in Marbella. It is, yes, in Avenida Ricardo Soriano. Yeah. Uh, we are number 12, just next to Massimo Ducci. It's always a good reference. Oh, okay. Especially you're, very, you're very close to one of the stores that I love, and that I, I forget the name, but I always remember the cow that stands outside. <laughs> Alio. <laughs> Alio. <laughs> I love That's that. That's another good reference. It, it's it's mm -hmm. a very good reference. <laughs> yes, always on the pavement. Uh, okay, so you've been around for nine years in the same... Yeah. Um, in uh, Spain. Spain. Um, in Marbella. In Marbella. The, the group started in Spain earlier on. It'll be probably now 14, 15 years, I think. Okay. 14, I'd say. Have you got plans to expand your section of your store? Well, obviously there are always plans, uh, but at the moment we're just uh, waiting to see um, how the situation gets a little bit better uh, because so if ev everything is very limited at the moment. So um, let's give it a bit of time so we can control the situation and then uh, we'll continue growing. It is seemingly easing off now. It's not as rigid as it was. Um, as a service industry, you were able to stay open during the COVID lockdown time, but your timings were much uh, less, correct? Correct, yeah, because we are essential. Uh, we've been open all the time, apart from a year ago when obviously everybody had to close uh, because everybody had to stay at home. Yes. Um, but uh, other than that, we've always been here. Even when we, we had to, to actually close the store, uh, we kept uh, our landlines on all the time, our email addresses, uh, so we could provide that customer service. So we've always been there, um, either physically in the store or on the other side of, of the line, uh, with longer timetables, shorter, but always there for our customers. You, as a very strong woman along this coast, you started right at the very bottom in very varied areas, uh, but always very top business areas. And now you have got your own store. How do you suggest, what would you suggest to young women who are starting their careers today? Where do they start? Whatever they think their passion is, uh, whatever that they feel they want to get to, they need to, to put all their efforts there and never stop, no matter what, always with, uh, you know, passion and, and a, a good will. I think you get whatever you want to. Yeah, it's step by step. But if you oh, have absolutely. To, it's everything in life. Yeah, but if you have got the passion, where do... If uh, a young woman today, or even a young man, want to start learning about optics, where do they start? It depends what area they want to cover, but uh, obviously uh, university is the main place to go to for, for the actual career right. uh, of, uh, of optometry. Uh, so in Spain, here in the South, uh, main universities are Granada and Seville. And then obviously, you know, they can develop their careers uh, like uh, some of our optometrists did here in, in my store. Um, uh, we've got, for example, Carlos, who did a, a master's degree in Chicago, uh, in the States. And um, so, yeah, there is it's a very, a very <laughs> big <place>. yes. <laughs> We are a box of secrets. 
<laughs> They're coming out slowly, slowly, slowly. Um, nice secret. <laughs> not a nice secret. So the next time I walk in, I'll, I'll try and have an American accent and say, oh, colors. <laughs> and we will both talk. Uh, Neria Galdas Little, it's been an absolute pleasure and a joy to speak to a woman who started in different areas, started at the bottom, now gotten to the top. And it's never the top because there's always going to be another way that you are going to improve depending on when the situations worldwide change. But in the meantime, thank you for what you've done for all of us. Thank you for what you do and have done for Lions International with the uh, spare spectacles that people have got. And for viewers who have got spectacles in their drawers, don't throw them away. Keep them until the time that you can give them back to Specsavers and uh, Neria and her team can deal with it that way. At least help people who are not as privileged as we are that are able to go in and just buy them willingly or when they are needed. But in the meantime, I say thank you for being my guest on Strong Women Along the Coast today. Take care, stay safe, and be well. And thank you to all your team. And even though they're wearing masks, they do always smile. Thank you. And thank you. It's been a pleasure to be with you. Thank you very much. Well, what a fabulous interview that was with Maria Galdas Little. And it just shows you how she changed her career midstream, although for 10 years that she was in really high flying business in the UK before she joined Spectators in the UK. And then, of course, uh, became the owner of Specsavers uh, down here in Marbella along the coast. And uh, just in case I omitted to say, she is not the general manager because Thomas is the general manager. She is the owner and she has got the most incredible uh, team of people who are working for her, who are qualified and have just changed everything that they have done in their lives as well. And they, they've just stayed for such a long time. So ladies, if you want to change your job or your position as you are young and you, or even you don't know what you want to do, have a thought about changing to optics because you know what? In my, everybody at some stage, wears glasses so there's always a job for you and you never know you may end up working with Neria and her team and Thomas at Specsavers in Marbella's Bay but in the meantime until we meet again take care stay safe and thank you for watching <laughs>